Hi everyone, I'm Susan Birch and welcome to another A Health Detective podcast. Today I have great pleasure in introducing you to Dr. David Kevin. Dr. Kevin specializes in diabetes and has spent most of his career writing and educating about how to prevent and reverse type, type 2 diabetes and also how to better manage type 1. He's written a number of books and his latest is called Busting the Diabetes Myth. And as always, I'll put the links to this in the show notes. He comes with a lot of credentials, and I think that this could be a great podcast to share with your GP if you want to talk about different ways to manage your diabetes. He was a consultant physician for the Bournemouth Diabetes and Endocrine Centre for 20 years. In 2013, he moved to Brussels, where he worked for three years as the director of policy and programs at the International Diabetes Federation. In 2017, he became closely involved in the diabetes reversal program in Bermuda, which I believe was very successful. He is now back in the UK as an independent consultant working on different diabetes projects and has resumed his clinical practice. Dr. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us today. Would you tell us a little bit about why you got so interested in diabetes and um, we can start from there. Oh my goodness. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, spend some time with you. I was back a very long way. My interest in diabetes um, arose from when I was a medical student um, some 30 plus years ago. And it was my first exposure to real life patients, if you like, in a hospital. And I was working with a group of doctors who were very passionate about diabetes, very good teachers. And it just got me thinking that this, this is a really, really interesting subject. And um, the rest, as I say, they say is history. There was nothing else that shifted my interests uh, so much. And I became a specialist in diabetes here in the UK um, many, many years ago. Um, but things have changed hugely uh, since then, and we've perhaps come on to that. And um, my interest very much now is, is helping people um, try and avoid some of the things I was learning about in those days, the complications that arise from diabetes, by taking, taking very much their health into their own hands and keeping themselves as well as possible. Yeah, I think there's a lot we can dive into with this topic and a lot of different different ways we can go. Perhaps we could just start talking a little bit about the global picture of diabetes. In New Zealand, 5% of our population, adult population have diabetes. We have one of the fastest growing obesity epidemics in the world. And we have a very um, you know, high increasing rate of diabetes in our young people, which is you know, really sad. And I know you talk about, you know, how this is expanding worldwide. Yeah. So one of my roles when I worked at the International Diabetes Federation was to oversee production of the IDF Atlas. And what that does every two years now is provide a global update on the estimates of the number of people living with diabetes. And just to give you an idea of the numbers, the first edition came out in the year 2000, and the estimate was around 150 million people globally had diabetes. They've just re uh, re released their 2021 figures, and they stand at over 500, um, over 500 million people. So it's gone up from 150 million well over three and a half times to something like 530 million people now globally living with diabetes and the vast majority of those are people living with type 2 diabetes. So it really begs the question what is it that's led to that big increase and you've mentioned yourself how you know in New Zealand you're seeing ever increasing numbers it's affecting people at a younger age Interestingly, when I was learning about diabetes, type 2 diabetes was a disease of the middle aged and, and elderly, and we're now seeing it in children. And the biggest driver, actually, 
worldwide. And the, the numbers are increasing in, in just about every country. I've been doing work in Africa where the rates are still relatively low, three, four, five percent, but they're again hugely higher than they were 20 years ago, and they're forecast to increase still further. It's happening everywhere. And in a nutshell, the reason why it's happening is a change in our lifestyles. And very specifically, uh, and, and predominantly in what we eat and what we drink. And I think there is now enough evidence from a number of studies in different places around the world that what we eat and what we drink can very strongly impact and increase our risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And that's the, one of the main messages that I really want to get across to people. Um, we used to say, oh, it's in your genes or it's not because you ate too much sugar. I'm afraid Yes, it might be partly in your genes, but we, our genes haven't changed that amount in the last 20 years to account for this huge increase. This huge increase is because our food environment has changed. You know, we, we, we all eat the food around us and we're now surrounded by very unhealthy food. A lot of it, I wouldn't even call food, it's ultra processed um, food products which, you know, as a result of very intensive marketing of the food industry's ability to make, produce things that taste really nice and want us to eat more and at a reasonable price, you know, we buy them. And what am I talking about? Well, the clear evidence is, is that the more sugar that we take in, the more we increase our risk of diabetes, but also, and you know, some people were quite surprised at this when the evidence first came out, but I think there's a lot of evidence now that if we eat too much starchy foods, then the same happens. Um, there was a study about, probably about 10 years ago, ago now from, from men in East Asia, uh, Japan, China, and it showed very conclusively that as those who ate more rice had increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And if you think about it, starch in rice is just glucose molecules, sugar molecules stuck together. Once they enter your mouth, the enzymes in your saliva are already bringing to break them apart into sugar. And, um, you know, I have been to New Zealand. I had a lovely in a few years ago, but I'm not as familiar there with the situation over here. But if you compare the sort of places where you can buy food and the sort of food you can buy now compared with just 20 or 30 years ago, it is hugely different. Um, you know, we have chains of coffee shops that sell, even the coffee sometimes contains the equivalent of about 20 teaspoons of sugar because it's full of syrup and various other things uh, masquerading as a cup of coffee. Um, you know, it, it, it has just changed so much. Thanks so much for talking about the starches as well, because I know that there's a huge push, you know, internationally and certainly in New Zealand about reducing sugar. But we talk about reducing sugar. Our guidelines talk about reducing sugar and replacing sugar with whole grain cereals. Yeah. Um, and so there doesn't seem to be that connection yet that those foods, as you just explained, break yeah. down to sugar um, when you eat them. Well, that's right. And we used to say to people with diabetes that, yeah, you should be eating exactly what you're saying, starchy foods, complex carbohydrates, we used to call them, uh, in, the, in the belief somehow that they would break down very slowly and have a, only a, a, a minimal effect on your blood sugar levels. But <clears throat> more and more people with diabetes now are wearing continuous monitors that provide a constant reading of what their blood sugar levels are. And it's a real eye opener when it's showing people, even those who inject insulin with their meals, if they have a, a, a meal that is high in starchy, starches, you know, a bowl of rice, even a bowl of cereal, their glucose level goes up to really quite high levels for quite a long period of time. And if you think about it, um, starch is glucose molecules stuck together. So there are, as those molecules are broken down, they become simple glucose very, very quickly. Table sugar is glucose plus fructose or fruit sugar. So as that's broken down, only half of it is actually glucose. The rest is fructose, which you know, can have its own effects. So actually, when you understand that, you can see that advising people to take their carbohydrates in the form of starch could actually be 
just as bad or even worse. And there's some evidence that this concept of glycemic index, there's some evidence that a bowl of, of white rice, for example, could have a faster effect on your blood sugar than a bowl of table sugar itself. So I really, really would, one of my biggest messages to people, whether you have diabetes or not, or if you're at risk of developing diabetes, or if you're just getting a bit overweight, begin to think of those white foods, the pasta, the potato, the rice, and the cereals as really to your body, a bowl of those is a bowl of sugar. Now, the purists will say, well, that's a vast oversimplification and you can't compare them. And OK, of course, it's going to be slightly different. But believe me, the effect on your, that it has on your body can be as damaging. And I really feel that, that what we need to do is encourage people not to stop eating starches altogether, but to get a better balance, to certainly get, you know, get, get good portions of vegetables into their diet and to avoid the highly refined starches uh, and, and potatoes, which if you feel like nature's equivalent of a highly refined starch. Perhaps a little bit later on, we can talk about quantities and you know how, how much starch you can um, actually effectively manage at a meal. But would you now just quickly go through and explain you know, what diabetes is and also, what's the difference between pre-diabetes and diabetes? Because, you know, I see a lot of clients who say, well, I've got pre-diabetes, I'm not a diabetic yet. And, and mm -hmm. trying to encourage them that, hey, now's the time to take some action. And, yeah. and really, it's just the early stage of diabetes um, is, is very important, you know? Okay. So a really good question. So diabetes is a number of different conditions but there are two main types of diabetes so first of all there's type 1 diabetes type 1 diabetes is a condition where um, it's an autoimmune condition it's a condition where the body's immune system attacks the insulin producing cells so you stop producing insulin it typically occurs in young people uh, uh, children or young adults but it can occur at any age and as it is an autoimmune disease that stops insulin production, you need to have insulin injections to treat it for life. Um, and it's not related to lifestyle. So it's got nothing to do with what drank in the past. It's nothing to do with being overweight. But that is globally just a few percentage of the total numbers. So it's important to understand that distinction because a lot of people with type 1 diabetes get quite forgotten about if you like and, and, and a bit fed up with all this notion about people with type 2 diabetes need to lose weight blah 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 and they get lumped in with that that is a different condition so then we have type 2 diabetes which accounts for the vast the vast majority of of the remainder and um, in type 2 diabetes the problem is not so much that the body isn't producing insulin it's that the insulin the body produces doesn't work now, what insulin is designed to do is to control the level of sugar in the bloodstream by taking the sugar that comes into the bloodstream from the gut. So that rice that I mentioned, if you eat that, it's broken out into the glucose in the gut. It gets absorbed into the bloodstream as glucose molecules. Insulin job is to, is to take that and push it into the body's cells where it's used as energy. And, you know, it's, it's great. So it's a good thing to have. Um, those carbohydrates for energy and it's a good thing that we have insulin to do that job. The problem arises your body is, is being asked to deal with an excess of energy, i.e. you're eating or drinking too much in the form of um, energy and particularly in the form of, of carbohydrates. And so what happens is the you know the insulin will do its job it'll fill the cells with the right amount of insulin of, of, of glucose give them the energy they need but then there comes a stage when those cells are full um, and yet there's still more sugar coming into the bloodstream so what's insulin got to do, got to do then so what it then does is it turns to the liver and the liver is a, an amazing organ it's a great big biochemistry factory that sits at the top of your stomach below the di below the diaphragm and um that can store glucose, um, excess glucose for, for future use. And it can do that in the form of something called glycogen. But there's only a certain capacity for that. And then when the glycogen stores are full, 
then the body's really clever. It says, right, okay, we need to put away some long-term storage and it stores, stores it as fat. And so the liver begins to store that excess energy as fat. I'm afraid this is quite a long explanation, but it will That's come around to what we're talking about. Yep. Now, um, <clears throat> one, of the th one of the problems is that a liver that is full of fats is, is then less able to control at how it works. And one of the thing that, things that the liver does is to release, remember I said there are some glucose stores in the liver, they're there to be released into the bloodstream for when we're not eating. So for example, in the middle of the night, if the sugar level goes a bit low, um, the liver will release some of that stored glucose into the bloodstream. And that also is under the control of insulin. But when the liver is full of fats, it's as though that the insulin no longer has that control on the liver. It's a bit like if you imagine a tap um, releasing glucose from the liver into the bloodstream. Um, and as though the liver is so full of fat that you know the system is, is sort of over overwhelmed and, and the tap becomes leaky. So regardless what, what's happening, the, 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 the glucose begins to pour out from the liver um, into the bloodstream, pushing the sugar level up even more, the glucose level up anymore. The body senses that, so it produces even more insulin to try and control it, but there's nowhere for it to go. So it stores it as even more liver fat. And that makes the liver le leak out even more, more sugar into the, into the bloodstream. So you get this vicious circle and you end up with the body producing more and more insulin, but the insulin not working. And that's called hyperinsulinemia, which means high levels of insulin in the blood and insulin resistance. And that's the key of what you're having type 2 diabetes. Now for a while the body can keep things under control um, and just about keep the sugar levels under control but bit by bit as the system becomes overwhelmed the sugar levels will begin to increase a bit and stay a bit too high. That's what we call pre-diabetes okay so even before you get to pre-diabetes, you've got this situation where the system has been overwhelmed, um, there's too much energy coming in, all the sugar stores are full, so excess fat is being stored, and that's causing this problem. Um, so the hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance is the first stage. The second stage is when, despite all that insulin, it can no longer keep the lid on the sugar level, it begins to rise. That's called pre-diabetes. And these are all, if you like, arbitrary definitions. Um, with the units that we use, if your fasting blood glucose is above um, 6.1, that's called pre-diabetes. Um, I think you use milligram, do you use millimoles? Millimoles, yeah, millimoles. Yeah, same as us, okay. But if the fasting blood glucose goes above seven, that's diabetes. So you're right, pre-diabetes, if you like, the very earliest stages where the glucose level rises above normal, and is called is pre-diabetes, but it is the same process. And you're absolutely right. At that point, when you've got pre-diabetes, it's exactly the best time to really do something about it because we know, we now know that if we can encourage people to change their lifestyles, particularly to change what they eat, then you can begin to undo that vicious circle and turn it around um, and actually reverse what I call that diabetes disease process and get things absolutely working, get the insulin levels down, get the glucose levels down and get things working again. And it can be done relatively simply by making changes, lifestyle changes at the stage of pre-diabetes. But actually at any stage, uh, in, even in people who've had established diabetes for 10, 20, 30 years, you might not be able to reverse it completely but you can certainly, by making lifestyle changes, get it under much better control and give yourself a much healthier outlook for the future. What are your thoughts about testing insulin? It seems to me that we miss an opportunity in early diagnosis by not testing insulin or C-peptide to see what's going on, you know? You're absolutely right. And so from what I've just uh, described, type two diabetes is actually a problem with insulin and the sugar problem comes a bit further down the line. Um, but insulin is actually quite difficult to measure. It's a lot more complex to measure in the lab than glucose. It's quite expensive. And in many places it's not routinely available. So it, you know, if, if you go to a private lab, they may do it for you, but it may cost quite a lot of money to do. 
So we generally have to rely without it being done. And I think that in a sense, you're absolutely right. It would be fantastic if, if we could measure people's insulin levels and detect the, the, the various earliest sign at which insulin levels are beginning to increase because that is a sure sign that this problem that I just described is, is already beginning to move forward. And you could pick it up maybe much earlier than if you wait until your sugar levels begin to, to rise a little bit. Um, and there are a number of people who are advocating that and wanting that to, to happen. In all truth though, in all honesty, um, I'm not sure it is absolutely essential because most people will be aware if they're beginning to put on a bit of weight, put on, a, you know, kilograms are moving up, the meters or the inches around their waist are, are beginning to increase. And if you're putting weight on, particularly around the middle, that is a really good sign that you're likely to be developing insulin resistance. And rather than waiting or trying to find a blood test, I encourage people then you know, that's, that's the point to start making changes. And um, if it is due to high insulin levels, then you should see that if you make changes to your diet and you begin to lose that excess uh, waste as well, that you're losing that, but that's a really good sign you're losing excess fat from the liver and that will help reverse those changes. But yes, in an ideal world, we would be able to measure insulin. I think it's about $40 or $45 over here for an insulin test. So, I mean, people could always go and fund it themselves. Yeah. Um, and I think it's not too expensive compared with the cost of having diabetes. But anyway. Well, ab ab absolutely. But yeah. I don't make the rules, but as, yeah. they, are, yeah. as they are over there, um, you know, and, and um, yeah, it is. It, 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 it is not hugely expensive. It's something that people could afford to get if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of people want to do that and they will source it themselves and fund it themselves. I think that's very valid. But if either you don't have that money or don't want to spend it, I think that, you know, if you can see that, as I said, you are putting weight on around the middle, um, then that's a pretty good sign to make a that's change. A, that's an excellent sign. But just talking about blood tests, what about using elevated triglycerides as a bit of a proxy marker for that as well? Is that is that relevant? Would that be acceptable? Well, yes, it yes, it absolutely is because triglycerides rise, and this is a type of body fat, um, and it's largely derived from excess carbohydrates in the diet, and it's a sign of what's called the metabolic syndrome, which is rather an old term, if you like, which which was used to describe this process, I think perhaps before it was fully understood. <clears throat> so, uh, and triglycerides are generally measured together with cholesterol levels in most places around the world um, and can be done very easily. Um, and basically they should be really low if they begin to increase, then that's an, again, absolutely good proxy that the system is, is dysfunctional in the way that I've described. Mm. Excellent. I had a question from something you said earlier and now it slipped my mind so I hope it will I hope it will come back to me so you've described the process of insulin and glucose and then we've we've talked about how those foods um, get into the system and yep. and start to increase um, increase those levels so could you talk a little bit about what the long-term implications are for your health if you don't get in control of this? Sure. So if you develop type type, if you develop diabetes of any sort, but we're talking about type 2 diabetes now, then the level of glucose in your blood will be high. And if it's high for a prolonged period of time, then that begins to have a number of adverse effects on just about every part of the body. And they're largely effects, um, particularly in type two diabetes on, 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 on blood vessels. And they can cause, um, you know, narrowing, narrowing of the arteries, um, high, high blood pressure, hypertension is very often part and parcel of this syndrome because high insulin levels makes blood pressure go up, go up. So you get all the risks of having high blood pressure such as heart attacks, strokes, um, 
adverse effects on the kidneys, causing the kidneys to become dysfunctional and potentially go into kidney failure. Um, smaller blood vessel changes can affect the eyes, causing loss of vision, blindness. Um, similar changes in the nerves can cause loss of sensation in the feet or disturbance of nerves wherever they nerves if you like it's like the electrical wiring system it controls anything that moves in the body plus many other processes and um, all of that can be affected directly or indirectly by poorly controlled diabetes and the high levels of blood glucose so and if you look historically a diagnosis of diabetes um, would be associated with a greatly increased risk of a number of these complications and of reduced life expectancy um, and often heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure, amputations because of poor circulation to the feet, all of these associated with an increased risk of early death. Um, so that's, that's the really bad news. You know, that's the implication of letting this process just run riot and not checking it. And up until about 10 years ago, we used to think that once you develop type 2 diabetes, you've got it for life and potentially it's just going to get worse and worse. And the best that we could do is offer you advice on lifestyle or treatment or even in insulin injections to try and slow down the progression. So it wasn't actually a terror. It wasn't really a message of hope. It was a message I think of despair, you know, you've got this condition, it's not very nice, it's associated with lots of nasty complications, and it's just going to get worse. So I can fully understand someone saying, well, what's the point? Why, I'm, why don't I just enjoy what time I've got and eat and drink what I like? That could not be further from the truth. And, and our relatively new, it's 10 years old now, but our understanding and our knowledge and our experiences that actually you can you as an individual in that situation you have the power to turn your future around to turn your future around from you know all that negative nasty disease if you like to one of better health um and it will require change it will require you to make changes particularly to your diet to what you eat and your drink but it's not requiring you to do anything particularly out of the ordinary. It's not requiring you to go on a starvation diet or to only eat leaves or do anything that anyone might find uh, you know, rather uh, strange or difficult to achieve. But for relatively small changes, it can have a massive change, massive impact away from that future of ill health towards a future of actually, in many cases, much better health because people who've been getting leading up to this this point in their lives metabolically for 10 20 years and one of the biggest things that i hear from people when they've, they've been able to turn it around is, i feel so much better best that i felt for 30 years and that's quite something and that that feeling of being better compared to that outlook of 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 lots of complications from diabetes is in many cases in the control of that individual if they're able and willing to make changes to their diet to turn that metabolic process around. We see in the media here some really extreme cases where people have undergone amputations and then all of a sudden they've made those changes and they're out there spreading the message, gosh, I don't know why I didn't do this earlier. You know, why did I wait till I had my leg amputated? or before I went blind, <clears throat> yeah. before I did something. Yeah, it's, um, so in many cases, people just didn't know mm. because until relatively recently, all the major um, guidelines in nutrition advice for people with diabetes has been to base all of your meals on starchy carbohydrate. Mm. Mm. And that arose because there was a big fear that it was, a um, some rather flawed logic but people with diabetes get vascular disease and heart attacks that's associated with high cholesterol therefore people we've got to get people off eating fats because it was thought that fat led to high cholesterol led to heart disease therefore surely it's much better if people eat carbohydrates and as we said earlier there was this belief that complex carbohydrates are okay mm -hmm. and so 
it's not as if people, it's not like smoking where people have known for decades that if they smoke, they've got a risk of getting a heart attack. Yeah. Yeah. You know, many of these people were perhaps, you know, trying to do what they've been told yeah. to do. Absolutely, absolutely and um, so much confidence and so, out there in, in, yeah. in the nutrition world and we're in a transition phase at the moment where mm -hmm. we have some people working in diabetes who are still following the old approach and and th <clears throat> think that you know that the problem is just people are too weak-willed and can't adhere to a prescribed diet and a growing number of those of us are saying look we just got to admit we got it wrong collectively and that telling people who have diabetes, which is by definition a condition of carbohydrate intolerance, telling them to eat carbohydrates with every meal is setting themselves, setting them up to fail. Mm. And I'd like to use that to lead into talking about medications. I can remember um, a cousin of mine a number of years ago saying to me, oh, I, I'll just eat whatever I want and I'll take some more insulin and that'll keep my blood sugar under control without really understanding. You know, it's that insulin, you, you spoke earlier, it's really a disease of insulin resistance. And, you know, while insulin is absolutely vital for our health, too much is, yeah. is a trigger for a lot of those conditions you talked about. Yeah. So this is where there's been a big, um, um, not confusion, but 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 mis misconstruing messages from type one diabetes into type two diabetes as if they're equivalent. And the message has been for many years now that if you have type one diabetes, which is a hormone deficiency disease, deficiency of hormone of the hormone insulin, then in theory you can eat whatever you like as long as you give the right amount of insulin to match that. But you know. A number of us now are realizing that even in type 1 diabetes that doesn't necessarily work because insulin injected via a needle into into the fat below your skin works in a very different way from insulin secreted in exactly the right way and the right time and the right amount from the pancreas into the bloodstream <clears throat> so i no longer say that to people with type 1 diabetes even i no longer say that because i don't think it works and i think again it's giving people expectations that are, are false um, but in type 2 diabetes, you're absolutely right. Now, um, the, that message has also got through because many people, certainly in the past and just now in type 2 diabetes, get put onto insulin. And sometimes they get put onto intensive insulin regimes, just like type 1 diabetes, and they're told to say, well, it's okay now, you're on insulin, so you can eat whatever you like. But in type 2 diabetes, that is absolutely the wrong message because just as you said, and I'd reiterate, the problem in type 2 diabetes is too much insulin. So if you're giving insulin to someone with type 2 diabetes, then it's actually not the best way to go around it. Um, there will be some exceptions. Sometimes people with type 2 diabetes, their insulin levels, their body gives up, they can no longer produce enough insulin. Then yes, but in the vast majority of cases, it's just adding fuel to the fire. And um, insulin is something that I would be very cautious about prescribing in someone with type 2 diabetes. And would, it, would that still not work for type 1 diabetes up to a point, you know, like they need to inject enough insulin to um, reach the basal um, insulin rates that we, all, that we all have in our bodies um, throughout the day. But surely you know eating too many of these um carbohydrate foods that turn into glucose and then using insulin to manage those i mean that's really the same situation isn't it so and you can get what is that what is sometimes termed double diabetes and this is people who have type 1 diabetes and yeah they have their basal rate amount of insulin is required just to keep things running over and then their mealtime insulin is determined by how much carbohydrate they eat. And if they eat a lot of carbohydrates, and they'll need to give quite a lot of insulin. And so they can, if you like, turn themselves into having type 2 diabetes by, if you like, falsely or not, not by artificially through injected insulin causing high insulin levels, which can set into train the same sort of process. And I've seen many people, so we have 
you know, people who follow, followed up in the places, diabetes center I work, uh, where they've been followed up for 20, 30 years, and we can plot their weight over those years and see that it's been gradually increasing really quite steeply. And in people with type one diabetes, I, I you know, they very often you know, point this out. They say, yeah, I really want to lose weight. And I have to say the only way, really effective way I know that you can lose weight if you have type one diabetes is by reducing the amount of insulin you inject. And the only way you can safely do that is by reducing the carbohydrates that you eat. So I am a great advocate of carbohydrate reduction to help manage type one diabetes, and particularly in people who've, who've developed the so-called double diabetes and become quite overweight. I see that quite a lot in the diabetes support groups, type one diabetics who are now, um, you know, bordering on obesity really. Yes, yeah. And, but the message to them has been really drilled in, you know, and some of them are, are, are a lot older, so it's been drilled in before sort of the new um, research and information has come out that you must take your insulin and, and, um, and yep. you must eat your, you must eat your healthy whole grains and starchy foods. Mm. And you must not miss meals and you must eat yeah. three meals a day. And some mm -hmm. were taught you must have snacks between your meals because mm -hmm. and that again comes from an era where we had really quite primitive insulins. People were on maybe one or at most two injections a day and they had to eat carbohydrates regularly through the day to protect mm -hmm. themselves from going too low because the insulin is working particularly well on that day. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that, you know, that sort of now 30 year old mm -hmm. method is still there and it's still prevalent and there are some people who are still being told that mm. Mm. and still believe it and they're still you know yeah. eating six meals a day and then you know two of those meals are a bicky and a cup of tea or something um. yeah. <laughs> so if people i mean i always emphasize to my clients that they must work with their gp in terms of reducing their medications as they start their dietary changes. Do you have any, um, you know, we don't give me medical advice here, obviously, but do you have any sort of recommendations sure. or thoughts? Well, I think the first thing to say is that, is to perhaps speak a little bit about the dietary advice and the dietary advice um, is, is essentially to encourage people to, um, and I do say to people, you know, are you willing to try and cut out sugars as much as possible from your diet? Because people, if people say, well, they're not willing to, then it's going to be really difficult. Most people say they're willing to try uh, because that really is essential. There's no point taking medication to reduce your blood sugar level if at the same time you're eating or drinking sugar, which is just going to cancel it out. And people understand that. So I say, look, the first thing is, and this is the most important, try and cut out sugars as much as you can from your diet. And for some people, that's a lot. And we have to talk about things like fruit, which are often very high in sugar. You know, a large banana could have a huge effect in increasing blood glucose level, a bowl of grapes, similarly. Uh, dried fruit even more, because it's very concentrated. But all of which people have been told is good and healthy. So that's one of the myths that we need to help people understand. That, you know, that just because sugar comes in the form of a fruit, which is sort of natural, doesn't make it good for you if you've got diabetes. And then the next stage is to look at the starches you're eating. And I just say, bear in mind, all of those starches will push up your blood sugar level. Um, are there some sort of starches that you'd be happy to do without or that you could cut down? And leave it really to people to make decisions that are going to be um, you know, right for them. Because there's no point me saying to someone, you know, some people have heard of a ketogenic diet, which is reducing your carbohydrates to 30 or 40 grams a day, which essentially means no sugars, no starches and getting, you know, getting those carbs from uh, non-starchy vegetables. For some people, that's fine. But for other people, that just isn't going to work because, you know, food has so many different connotations to different people and different foods. And and so on and so forth. So I think it's absolutely right. It should be individual, and the person to decide is that individual. What am I? Able, what changes am I able to make that are going to be sustainable? That are going to be long term? Because this isn't a change for you know a few weeks or a few months. This is permanent. 
Um, and for some people, they say, yeah, I don't really like bread anyway, and I can manage without breakfast cereals, and I'm not hungry in the morning, so I can skip breakfast, which is fine. Um, and I'm happy just to have a you know, small portion of rice if the family having big rice dish, and I'll cook extra vegetables for me to have instead. You know, there are ways if you're willing to make it work, where you can make it work. Um, and, uh, but cutting, cutting out sugars, cutting back on starches. That's essentially the approach that I recommend. And to be honest, I say, I don't really care what you eat otherwise at this stage. That's the really important thing. Um, and, but what that will do is very quickly have quite a big impact in reducing your blood sugar levels, which is what we want. You know, that's great. But if you're on certain medications, that could be dangerous and it could push your glucose levels down to levels that are too low. So the number one absolutely essential is if you're on any medication for your diabetes, please talk to your doctor or your health professional who manages your diabetes. Explain to them that you're going to reduce your carbohydrates and ask for their advice in adjusting your medication. Now, there are some medications that are not going to cause any problem at all. Um, the ones that really, really do need to be addressed are any types of insulin, the dose will need to be reduced, and any drugs that increase insulin levels, and this is a group called sulfonylureas, they would also need to be reduced. But, you know, if you're on medication for your diabetes, it must be reviewed before you make big changes. If you're not on any medication for your diabetes, you can go ahead because it is not, you know, you, you, there will be nothing that will cause a real problem with your blood sugar level by making those changes to your diet. I really like what you said about um, people making changes that they can live with long term. You know, I mean, the ketogenic diet has sort of hit the, hit the ground running over the last few years and lots of people do really well on it. But I also see a lot of people who don't do so well on it and uh, which is a completely different discussion about kind of you've swapped one form of energy you know for another form of energy from fat and so that's a different discussion I tend to try and well I tend to recommend you know starting off with getting about the, you know 30 grams or less of carbs you know maybe 20 to 30 grams of carbs per meal when you're first starting and when you're changing when you're changing that diet so you know if you're eating two meals a day you know that's 60 but you know maybe 90 to 100 grams of carbs a day and I agree completely with what you just said about exchanging them out for as many you know fresh vegetables as you can and perhaps controlling that fruit. I think people don't realize that, you know, a small potato is 30 grams of carbs or two slices of bread is 30 grams of, yeah. is 30 grams of carbs. So, so it, can quick, it can quickly add up. And I, I don't actually talk in, gram, in terms of grams of carbohydrate because a, a lot of people don't really know you know what, what you know how much carbohydrate there is in a potato or a slice of bread or whatever if people ask me then I would say something very similar to what you've just said I would say look um if you know for people who ask me I say well look if you can get down to below 100 grams of carbs a day then you're going to see really good improvements because most people are going to be eating between 200 and 300 grams a day. We know that's the average in people with diabetes and I think without diabetes. Um, I have no problem with a ketogenic diet, which means going down much lower and, eat, and burning fat as your fuel, but it is, it is restrictive. It is a more, it is quite a big different, you know, it requires more changes. And what I see is quite often people will start on the more moderate reduction find that actually yeah i can eat a meal without carbs you know against everything i've been told and i'm still alive and actually i feel i've got more energy uh because my sugar levels are down and they may then themselves choose either because they want to lose more weight or they really want to push their sugar levels down to go onto a ketogenic diet and i'll support them if they want to do that but that will be their own choice okay. because you know they feel you know usually by then they've got a good idea of what it entails okay. and they feel that they could do that 
I think that one thing I really don't want to do is to set people up to fail. So many people, they've failed already. You know, they've tried different diets, they've okay. done what they've been told, but their sugar levels are going up. So if we then advise them to say, right, okay, you've got to get down to about 30 grams of carbohydrate a day, and you must, ne- must not eat any starches uh, or sugars, that immediately becomes quite restrictive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we know that some people have, if you like, uh, an addictive relationship with some foods. And, mm-hmm. and unless that's been addressed, to say, you know, that that's what you've got to achieve and they then fail, that's another failure to notch up. So I would, you know, I, I start much more leaving it with them. And if they want to make that change to a, a ketogenic diet, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Excellent. That's great. And, you know, I'll just touch briefly on protein. I don't know what your thoughts are about protein, but I'm a fairly strong advocate of protein. I kind of think of of protein as being on the nutrient side of the fence and the carbohydrates and fats on the energy side. So I sort of kind of look at trying to reset, reset that balance. I don't know what you, if you have any particular thoughts about that. um, well, protein is essential. Um, the body cannot, you know, the body needs protein for all sorts of things. It cannot make it all uh, from other things. So we need to eat protein every day. And there are some fats that are essential. We need to eat some fat every day. Mm. It's actually the carbohydrates that are not essential because the body can make the glucose it needs from those other things. Mm. So that's the first point. The second point is, um, so yes, it is essential to have protein. And I think protein, I, you know, I don't want to become too prescriptive, but I generally advise to have protein with every meal because protein, um, it, it, it provides you with the essential nutrients, as you say, um, it is satiating. It makes your, you know, it, it, you feel fuller with, with protein in a meal, meal for longer. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's not going to have a significant effect on your blood glucose levels. So, so protein, absolutely. Um, I think if we look at the various different types of, um, of, of diet that's out there, there isn't a huge range in, in protein intakes. You know, I think there's a huge amount of protein and we can't manage without any. So I don't focus particularly on, on, on particular amounts of protein. But what I do say is if you're reducing your carbohydrates, um, you know, and you need to maintain your energy intake, um, um, unless you're you know, needing to lose a lot of weight, of course, then you might need to have a, maybe a slightly bigger portion of protein than you would have done previously to give you that feeling of satiety. Um, so that's my, you know, my, my, my spiel on protein. Um, and then with, 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 with fats, again, saying that you know, you've got to be careful of fat because it is, it is high in calories. And, you know, if you do eat a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of cheese or a lot of nuts, you're going to build up the calorific intake. But actually adding healthy fats, and that's really, to my mind, a, a fat in a natural form to, to a meal, again, can help you you know it increases satiety makes you feel fuller um and you know is is it provides a good balance but again without specifying a particular quantity of fat i think that's really good advice and i guess my only other caveat with protein would be as we get older our need increases and quite often that's when we that's when we stop eating protein and we sort of eat other foods yes just another question in elderly people over 70 80s i had some questions last week from some 80 year olds saying you know i'm too old to do anything what what are your thoughts about that you're never too old <laughs> excellent you're never too old and i'll give you an example um I had a and I quoted him in, 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 in my book, a patient who I don't think I've ever seen because my first consultation with him was during one of the lockdowns last year. So we did a telephone consultation. He was 88 years old and his glucose levels were high and he'd been told he, he'll probably need some more medication. So I said, well, you might do, but are you willing to make some changes to what you eat? And maybe we can avoid the medication. 
And I then spoke to him, I think about, so I just talked very briefly, as I did, you know, a little while ago about cutting out sugars and reducing starches. Three or four months later, we had another phone conversation. He'd had another blood test just beforehand to check his HbA1c, and it had plummeted. And so he did not he did not need any more medication. His blood sugar levels came under much better control. He'd lost some weight, and he'd done it all himself on the back of that one conversation of less than fifteen minutes. So, you know, you are you are never too old, um, and I think that goes for everything. Now. Um, Obviously, there are some caveats. Some people who are very physically unwell, or they're disabled, or they're you know they 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 may have a degree of dementia where it, it makes it much more complex. But you know, just because you're eighty doesn't mean you're too old to make changes. All right, a couple more questions. We're just about just about done our time. Exercise. Um, are you an advocate of exercise for managing diabetes? No. So, in, in, in a word, and one of my myths that I bust in the book is, is you know, I say you do not need to exercise. Um, but, the, but let me explain what I mean. And the reason I say that, but let me say, first of all, exercise is really good. It's good for our heart. It's good for our muscles. And it you know, if we can build up our muscle bulk, our, you know, our muscles will, if you like, use more glucose for fuel. It has lots of good reasons to do exercise and it's good for our mental well-being. But if I'm sitting across as I was earlier today, someone recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, very overweight, struggling to, not particularly old, he was in his 60s. Oh, you know, you've got a whatever the official guidance is you've got to do a brisk 30 minute walk every day it's a non-starter let you know let alone go to the gym or do anything like that the people who want to do that that's fine i'm not saying don't but the it's you do not lose weight purely by exercise and you will not you will not manage your diabetes just with exercise the more you exercise then it can help the other things like the dietary changes but there are two things I do advise. One is to walk as much as you can. And rather than saying, oh, find a time to go out for a walk for an hour every evening. I don't want people to find time or make time. I encourage them to build it into their everyday routine. Mm -hmm. So if you're driving somewhere, park a few hundred meters away from where you need to get to so that you've got to walk some of the route. If you're on a bus, then get off one or two stops before you need to. Um, if you just got to walk for a kilometer or less then, or if that's your journey, don't even think of driving, walk. Um, and so some people, even that is a long way, but just getting to the message, you know, if you're going shopping, just park in the, in, in the parking lot away from, you know, as far in the far corner, so you've got to walk, build that walking into your routine. There are lots of little ways that you can do it. That's number one. And number two is do not sit down for longer than an hour because there is a lot of evidence that um, long sedentary periods, I sit sitting down, your metabolism goes into a sort of sleep mode, just as your computer does if you ignore it for an hour for a period of time. Um, you know, it, 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 the metabolism slows down to conserve energy, glucose levels begin to rise. And literally all you need to do is stand up, walk around for a minute and sit down again. And it's like breaking into that sleep mode, speeding things up. And so, yeah, I'll say to people, if there's particularly they're working at a, at a desk all day or um, sitting at TV for several hours, just set your phone or your watch to buzz every hour, just get you up out of your seat. And that is what I cover with exercise. And a lot of people find that really reassuring because they'll say, oh, I haven't lost weight because I'm not, I'm not exercising or I, you know, my sugars are high because I'm not exercising. Yes, they will help. But the biggest thing to do to both lose weight and to improve your glucose levels is to change what you eat and keep moving as much as you can. I really love that bit of advice. And I'm just going to reiterate, you're not saying don't exercise. <laughs> if you love exercising and you're already exercising, please don't stop. But we're talking about people who have type 2 diabetes, maybe significantly overweight and haven't exercised for a considerable time. And I'm I sorry, find there, are, 
that group quite often once they feel better and lose weight they actually feel that they want to be they more do. active they do and I'm not sure you're probably familiar with the direct study in the UK, which is a very low calorie approach mm -hmm. to lose a lot of weight quickly. Those participants are actually told not to exercise um, and, you know, until they've lost the weight because there are risks. I mean, I know someone who, uh, uh, um, again, he's, he's quoted it in, in the book. Um, he felt he needed to lose weight. He went to the gym. He had a heart attack in the gym mm -hmm. because he was exercising too intensively and he wasn't fit enough to do it. Um, so I don't use the word exercise, I just use the word physical activity, try and increase your physical activity and sit down this. Well, I mean, that's another whole subject, this whole boot camp, you know, high intensity training thing, feeling like that's what you have to do and the dangers and the, and the risks of injury around that. But anyway, that's a, that's a different <laughs> conversation for another day. Um, would you just finish off giving some advice to parents with their children? It breaks my heart to see the um, rising obesity in New Zealand, and I, and I know it's everywhere, but I would love to be able to see that that stopped. Have you got any bits of advice for parents? Well, that's a, a difficult one. Um... It's essentially the same. I, I guess that my single advice would be to limit the limit sugar intake as much as you feel you're able to. And you by know, sugar, you're you're meaning added sugars, but we're also clarifying that to mean all those processed carbohydrates yes. that turn well, into sugars. Well, yeah. so most processed foods have got sugar in sugar in them. I mean, I think I think it's really difficult. Um, I'm no longer a parent of a young child. I'm now a grandparent of three young children. They've all come along in the last two years. And, you know, it's really, you know, my eyes, I'm looking at it with very different eyes because when my kids were small, you know, I hadn't got a clue about any of this. We just gave them what, you know, what was around. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I shudder really when I think, think of it. So, you know, I'm encouraging my children to give their children plain yogurt, you know, with a few berries added rather than mm -hmm. buying those yogurt pots that have got lots of sugar in. I'm encouraging them to, you know, make sure there's protein in, in, in a meal with some vegetables rather than, you know, just making it carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. I know when they're very small, it's really difficult because they're really, I'll tell you what they want to eat or not. But I think first and foremost, it would be just be aware that sugar is, sugar is the biggest culprit um and try and avoid processed foods and i know that's difficult because these things are marketed to to appeal right at those young kids um so it's not easy but that's what i try and suggest thank you very much would you just tell people where they can find you um we'll make sure we put all those links in the show notes and a link to your book but would you just finish up by telling people where they can find you and as I said in the beginning, I'd love for this to be a podcast that um, people could take to their GP and then have this conversation. And I'm sure you would be willing for any GPs who wanted to reach out and, and, and talk about oh, this as, as a way of... Yeah. 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 So, um, I... I so where can you find me? Well, I'm over here in England, but I have a <laughs> I have a website. It's drdavidcavan.com, um, and it just gives information about my books and, and you know some little articles that that I write. I, I it's it's not it's not hugely extensive, but it's got my contact details as well. So that's where you can find that information, um, and yeah, details as you say of the books that I've I've written up till now. Fantastic, thank you. And I tracked you down on LinkedIn, so um, I eventually managed to <laughs> managed to track you down and find you. Well, thank you so much for your time today, and it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk. <laughs>